Thank you all for taking the time. It's my absolute pleasure and I'm incredibly grateful to Adrian. My pleasure to introduce Adrian. Um, this week, I imagine, must have been one of the busiest weeks of Adrian's life. It would be busy if you were the head of the Jenner Institute. It would be busy if you were faculty at Oxford. It would be busy if you co-founded Vaxitech. And Adrian actually holds all three of those roles. So incredibly busy week given the fantastic interim results uh, that were presented on Monday. So Adrian, thank you so, so much for taking the time. We appreciate it. Um, there's no one better to learn from. Maybe you can help set the scene initially by explaining those different groups to us and how they fit together, please. Sure, so I'm gonna take you back 20 years in Oxford University, long before Vaxitech was a twinkle in my eye, uh, there were quite a few groups interested in vaccines uh, from two different departments in the university, one focusing on clinical trials of pediatric vaccines, which begat Andrew Pollard's program, which exists today. And then lots of us who were basically immunologists or geneticists thinking about new ways of making very difficult vaccines like ones against HIV or malaria or TB. And uh, with some new buildings on the Old Road Campus site, some of us came closer together. And it seemed to me it was a good time to bring everyone together and found a new institute called after Edward Jenner. So the Jenner Institute was founded in 2005 as a sort of umbrella organization within the university to bring together all the people interested in fantasizing about making vaccines, testing them, licensing them, saving the world, etc. So we've been going 15 years. There's never been a year like this one, but uh, we have gradually, through critical mass, uh, been able to access lots of core facilities like a GNP manufacturing facility to manufacture our own vaccines for clinical trials. Uh, lots of core facilities on our favorite technologies, which are virus-like particles, and of course, uh, viral vectors. And uh, people have come. Uh, and one of the advantages of being in Oxford is fantastic people come in their 20s and 30s. And the uh, thing has really, re really grown. We've totally run out of space. We do have a nice clinical uh, trials facility very close to the main Jenner Institute. And in 2015, really partly driven by Sarah Gilbert's work on flu, which couldn't raise the funding for commercial uh, for development of a flu vaccine from uh, government sources or from charities. She and I got together, spun out uh, Vaxitech uh, through uh, OUI, the tech transfer company, and of course OSI, which was very new in those days, uh, was keen to uh, invest with uh, other notable partners in uh, Vaxitech. And we came up with it with that model, and that's gone th uh, forward, you know, whatever five miles away from the university in uh, in Oxford, doing really exciting things in both the therapeutic space as well as prophylactic uh, vaccines. So that's uh, a short account of how we got to be where we are. It makes total sense. Thank you. And Vaxtech and the university co-invented the Chimpadna virus vector, um, and you had some great success applying it to success applying it for MERS last year, which seems, given it's a coronavirus, it might have been relevant this year. Can you help us understand uh, the Chadox vector and then actually what you did with MERS last year? Sure. So Chad vectors go back to 2003 for me when I thought these would be good because we were, and I'm still primarily supposed to be working on malaria vaccines, uh, targeting African children, where there's a lot of anti-vector immunity to all sorts of viruses. So I knew that human adenovectors were not going to work very well. We were interested in T-cell inducing vaccines. That's the main platform of the years for malaria vaccines. And adenos are an obvious choice. So I had to get hold of chimpanzee adenovectors. It took about seven or eight years. By then we had done clinical trials, partnering initially with Merck or a spin-off called Akiros, and went into the clinic in 2007. 
and uh, then began to access our own chimbadeno vectors from here and there. Made Chadox 1 back in 2012, Chadox 2 came along, and then when uh, Vaxitec was founded in 2015, these two vectors were the initial core technology that allowed us to explore a lot of other indications, including particularly uh, uh, commercially valuable indications like uh, therapeutics and cancer vaccines as distinct from what we tend to do in the Jenner Institute, which is really tough targets like malaria and TB. That would be great if we could get them to work, but uh, we'll take 20 years and not, uh, not 10 months like uh, COVID. So of relevance, back in 2014, at the time of the Ebola experience, when we actually were involved in four new vaccines going from Oxford to Africa to try and put out that outbreak, two of them adenoviral vectors, it became very clear to us and to a lot of people in the vaccine space that we were really exposed to any new outbreak pathogen. There's a long list of 10 to 12 that uh, might cause real trouble. And in the last five years, Sarah Gilbert heading that program at the Jenner has come up with, I think it's now eight different outbreak pathogen vaccines that have gone into the clinic. One of them you mentioned, Tom, MERS, that went in a few years ago and is now in trials in Saudi Arabia and the UK. And of course, famously in January of this year, COVID-19, again, with Shadox 1. So that vector has had many uses for the people in the Institute and of course for Vaxitec, who are developing programs that you know well in the therapeutic area and some prophylactic ones as well. So what we did when, uh, of course, the IP for Chadox 1 and Chadox 2 went to Vaxitech with some carve-outs for things like malaria that were already up and running in the Institute. So when uh, COVID came along, that wasn't a carve-out because nobody had ever heard of it. So Vaxitech had the IP for that. But Sarah thought this little Chinese outbreak would be a nice demonstration project for how quickly she could make a vaccine. Um, she had no idea that that Wuhan virus, as it was in mid-January, might go global until the end of the month, which seemed a, a year later. And uh, suddenly we had the opportunity to work with Vaxitech, and she did. And then uh, before the AstraZeneca deal, there was, of course, an agreement between Vaxitech and the university on taking this forward. So that's really how we came to be where we are. Made an amazing timeline. So to put it in perspective, Sarah didn't see the genome for SARS-CoV-2 until February of this year. No, no, no. She saw the, she saw the genome about the 14th of January and started making a viral vector to show how quickly she could make a viral vector, not to save the world. So by the end of January, early February, we started to think maybe this could be um, rather useful. And uh, the, the process through to sort of phase three interim results uh, would normally take well over five years. Uh, we're now looking at something like six months. Uh, what, how's the time compression worked? What's, how, what's the team in conjunction with AstraZeneca, obviously the Jenner Institute as well, what's the focus been? How have the timelines been compressed? Yeah, a few things. Um, Firstly, uh, regulators, ethical committees, all sorts of administrative uh, uh, officers in the university and elsewhere have been aware of what we were doing from reading the newspapers, and they really have stepped up to uh, facilitate the approvals process. But more importantly, we've had literally hundreds of people who have done tools on what they were supposed to be doing, whether it was your DPhil project or a postdoc project, and uh, join the uh, legion of people working on COVID, uh, slightly incentivized by the university's decision that you either work on COVID or you stay at home. So lots of people came to work on COVID, particularly in the trial program. And then the thing kept growing, of course, going to Brazil, to South Africa, to India, to 19 sites in the UK. And again, people responded very, very quickly. So 
partly uh, the willingness of people who were in place on salaries did not have to be recruited uh, to join the team, partly the manufacturing facility downing tools, I think they were making a NEPA vaccine or about to, turning the whole thing over to making COVID vaccines as quickly as possible. We had a record of working with people in several countries on manufacturing, not just in, in Italy, but also Serum Institute of India and others, so that helped uh, as well. And uh, the small matter of money, the, the government in about late March decided to put quite a lot of money our way to support the program after SEPI had given a little, the university had given a little and so on. So all of that helped things move very, very quickly. But finally, there's the clinical trial design where phase three overlapped phase one. So we started phase one at the end of April. Uh, at the end of May, we were starting phase three which is um, not typical. It's extraordinary. And the um, partnership with AstraZeneca, obviously be quite quick to work with them because they could concurrently start manufacture preemptively, which obviously would be used in the clinical trials as well. Um, so part of that agreement is that the, uh, the vaccine would be delivered at cost uh, during the pandemic, and then actually in the developing world at cost um, for perpetuity. That seems to be unusual amongst all of the other programs. How did that come about? That really came from the top of the university, from the vice chancellor, uh, who uh, insisted that that should happen. I mean, our view was that price, funnily enough, might be less important than scale. So way back in March, we were talking to manufacturers at several sites in Asia, a few in the UK, but you know, manufacturing capacity is not great in the UK for, for vaccines, a couple in, in uh, continental Europe that we knew quite well. So we ended up with that two-pronged approach, manufacturing tech transfer and scale up that Sandy Douglas and I were very involved with. And then the, the negotiations on price with AstraZeneca. And to be fair, AstraZeneca were kind of presented, um, I, I made the initial introduction and explained what we wanted to do. And we had had discussions with a previous company or two who didn't say no, but absolutely were treating this as a normal deal and they'd uh, let us know. Uh, and AstraZeneca kind of said, yeah, we, we see the point. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll do well from seasonal use. This virus is not gonna go away anytime, which you know is a conventional view now, but it certainly wasn't a conventional view in, in April, so it was good that they, they could see that that model worked. And I think they just liked the idea of expanding in, in vaccines with an opportunity that would uh, bring in a lot, of, a lot of funding from elsewhere, as well as their internal resources. And Pascal was uh, you know, up for this right from, from day one. And, and to their credit, part of uh, the agreement was them committing to extraordinary volumes, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, no, no, I don't think anybody else would have done that. And, you know, there was a time when I think the AstraZeneca commitments outnumbered all the other vaccines put together. That's corrected itself a little bit, but it's it's now something like 3.7 billion. I, I've seen on a recent chart from them that that 3 billion is, is, is in the public domain, but it looks like more than that to me if everything works out and the scale up works in every one of those 10 or 15 countries that manufacturing is ongoing in. Makes sense. And then the incredible effort, incredible work done scientifically, commercially, in terms of the partnerships. And then Monday this week, the first or, or the second big reveal after the sort of early data around safety in the summer. So the phase three interim results, it must have been a sort of heart stopping moment for you. But I imagine relief set in quickly. What was your quick reaction to that? What, yeah, I'd love to hear some thoughts. It's obviously been a lot of press and then much of it has been superficial. Um, what was your interpretation of those three, phase three interim results? Yeah, so, so first of all, we didn't know on Saturday that we were decoding on Sunday. A lot of things had to happen. It actually happened. So for me, the big day was Sunday, seeing uh, the results, which had just come in from the statisticians. And uh, yeah, they were, they were you, you know, because of the buildup of Moderna and Pfizer having such high efficacy, it was just a huge relief that, you know, we weren't down at 50% or something. So uh, seeing the 90% was great. 
it appealed to me a lot because I'm a sort of experimental medicine guy deep, deep down. And, you know, I do early stage clinical trials, not phase three. So the idea that we would have put in a slightly left field low dose, full dose immunization regimen in there. And it was not only okay or as, as good as some people hoped, it was significantly better than uh, the other regime. That, that, that was terrific. And of course, dose sparing and better tolerated and everything as well. So, so that, that was a real highlight. And uh, then, of course, already we had the, um, the data on asymptomatic infection, which we thought neither of the other competitors had, and I think that's now being confirmed. Uh, but remarkably, you know, we see that uh, at least in one of those groups, we're clearly getting uh, efficacy against asymptomatic infection, which is fantastic for outbreak control to uh, prevent transmission. It makes sense. And so just for everyone's understanding, essentially in your trial, you're swabbing people on a weekly basis to pull transmission that other trials wouldn't see. So I'd love to learn more about that. And then I guess the other end point, which seems perhaps the most important for all of us as individuals, uh, there was no severe disease. <laughs> so maybe could you cover those two? Yeah, so there are really three endpoints that you're looking for. One is severe disease and death. And uh, there were no cases of uh, either in the vaccination group, uh, double figures in the uh, control group. So that's uh, a significant difference. You know, we're getting the impression that this is a disease where it's relatively easy to protect against against severe lung disease. That came out in the early non-human primate studies uh, all three uh, large studies that have reported now see almost no severe disease, which is, is very good news, of course. So you probably don't need a terrifically good vaccine to protect against that. Then uh, 60 to 90 with an average of, uh, 62 to 90 with an average of 70%-ish on the interim analysis of the uh, primary endpoint, which is clinical uh, disease. And then again, analysis, as I mentioned a moment ago, on asymptomatic infections, trying to get a read on prevention of transmission. Just to explain, in case you're wondering why, the, why a small company like Pfizer might not have bothered to do asymptomatic infection in a 40,000 subject trial, we were doing a, just a 22,000 subject trial. We're now at something like 140,000 swabs that have been analyzed already. And it's not doing PCR on 140,000 swabs. It's getting the people at home uh, living their normal life, feeling fine to do a swab every week and post it in to us, to a central facility that uh, actually works in the UK. We can show that. We didn't even try in Brazil. I don't think it would have worked in South Africa or anywhere else. So it's, it's not really easy to do, but it's a tribute to those volunteers that they they did that with something like over 85% of the swabs arriving. It's uh, extraordinary. Unbelievable. Uh, so I'm going to hand across and um, Krishna and David Schenkein have some questions initially. So Krishna, it'd be great if you could pose a question. Yeah, I, yeah I, thank you for, uh, for making the time to, to talk with the group here. Congratulations on uh, you know, all, of the, all of the amazing uh, progress here. I think it's, it's probably a question in everybody's mind. Uh, just now that we're at this stage, uh, what do you think about the next steps, manufacturing and distribution? Uh, clearly a lot of uh, uh, preemptive work has gone in here uh, uh, around the world. Uh, where are areas that you find yourself still concerned? Uh, areas where we might be able to mobilize more of the community around and, and perhaps uh, where are areas where there's already plenty of attention and resource and, uh, and don't need any more help uh, around? Yeah, so manufacturing has been close to my heart throughout the whole thing. I'm not a manufacturing guy, but I have lots of people at the Jenner who uh, focus on this and we run our own small, uh, small facility. Um, I'm pretty confident that that, that is going to work out, unprecedented though it would be. You know, I like to say nobody's produced half a billion doses of the vaccine ever and distributed them in a year. And that is true, but you know, not too many places have whatever it is, 15 facilities manufacturing the same product and uh, probably most of the planet wanting a, wanting a dose. So th this is different. There's been some lead in time 
Uh, before the AstraZeneca deal, we had worked with CROs in China and in India and in continental Europe. So they've been manufacturing since then. The, the challenge really has been alignment. So we're producing the same product in each place. But the facility I know best because my malaria programs uh, licensed to the Serum Institute of India have produced more vaccine than anybody else so far. They have, uh, depending on what the, um, the initial dose is, either one to 200 million or 200 to 400 million doses of vaccine made already. By the end of the year, they will have more and they have a contract for a billion doses. And then there's a, a Russian manufacturer I know far less about, I'm told, has a, a contract for something similar. And then much more typical size manufacturers for 200, 300 million doses here and here and there. So, you know, the real test comes now. All of these guys were doing this at risk, of course, before Monday. Uh, now it gets really serious. Um, but, you know, that's not the most immediate thing. The most immediate thing just to use headings are to understand better the trial data and we're doing that over the next few days at an analysis level but there's some immunology needed as well particularly why the low dose high dose works better uh, and second obviously getting a registration of this product which uh, hopefully will happen uh, this side of Christmas maybe even you know early mid-December with the MHRA and EMA. Maybe yeah, so Adrian and team, first of all, con I share my congratulations for the work you've done. It's uh, tremendous and all of us, thank you. Um, you. You mentioned it briefly just a second ago and I'm just curious because there's been a lot of discussion around understanding the scientific rationale to explain why the low dose may have been better than the high dose. I, at least the press is reporting that it wasn't planned uh, to do that low dose, but uh, it's always better to be lucky than to be right. So um, just curious how you think about that or are the numbers too small to know or is, it, do, is there a scientific rationale that you're leaning towards? Yeah, let, let, let me just clarify a little bit. We, we did know what we were doing and what dose we were giving. The, the reality is, uh, which has not really been reported in the press, was that we were quite constrained by vaccine supply. Okay, so we didn't sit down and say, look, we better not give the full dose because we only have enough material, we'll have twice as much if we, we give a low dose. We, we did take that into account. And uh, some of the manufacturing batches coming from different places failed in the, in the early months. So that was a real squeeze. So we had started a half dose to compare it with a full dose and the immunogenicity looked the same, but the safety profile or at least the tolerability was better. Not surprisingly, you often see that with viral vectors. If you have the dose, it's uh, less painful, et cetera. Um, so we carried on and we then ended up with quite large numbers onto the period when we had lots of uh, vaccine and then everyone got full dose and full dose. So it was deliberate, it wasn't an accident, et cetera. Et cetera. So, um, and of course, we were conscious of the numbers we were talking about a moment ago on global supply. It, I still think that low dose, low dose might be really good. We just have very few people uh, dosed with the 2.5. And when I say low, ask Sarah what the standard dose of her MERS vaccine is, and the answer is it's low dose, single dose. So it's not very low. It's, it's Whenever you use a chimp adenovector, you end up with either 2.5 or 5, and most of the time it's 2.5 with Chalox 1. So it's not you know, unusually um, small. The interesting question, though, is, is why does it work? And I think it's very likely to be a very prosaic explanation. We know that with viral vectors, you get antibodies induced and T cells to the viral vector. They stop you boosting very efficiently, usually for several weeks and sometimes several months. And that's because when you give the second dose, a lot of it gets mopped up by the antibodies you induce to the vector. Uh, what uh, we did, of course, was halve that dose. <clears throat> Presumably that gives less anti-vector immunity and allows the second dose to boost better. What we were also doing is looking at different prime boost intervals. We have a lot of people with two to three months 
prime boost intervals, that probably helps as well. So I think that's the main part of the answer. There are lots of other clever ideas that we're going to look at in terms of you know, escalating dose immunization, which is actually a thing uh, that came out of MIT a few years ago. Maybe there's an element of that phenomenon in there, but it's just mainly dampening anti-vector immunity, I think. And the <clears throat> low doses have the advantage. They increase the number of the reach of the existing virus and production dramatically. I think, Vidu, you were going to ask a question about the stability, et cetera. Yeah, no, exactly. Hey, Adrian, it's great to be speaking. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Um, you've made the point a number of times that this isn't a competition between this approach and the other vaccine approaches. But we'd love to hear about some of the things that make us particularly excited about Chadox, particularly around the point of stability, logistics, transportation, and ultimate cost to the end user. Yeah, so, so thank you. Clearly, this vaccine is stable for a year and probably much longer at four degrees or two to eight degrees centigrade standard temperatures for distributing around the world, whether it's in a GP's surgery or it's in rural uh, Burkina Faso. Um, that is not the case with many newer technologies, including uh, mRNA vaccines. And that that's actually highly relevant for the Department of Health when we talk to them here. They, they really don't like having to uh, distribute in places with minus 70s for one of the other vaccines. But, you know, once you go global, it's, it's crucial that it's uh, uh, stable at four degrees and ideally for two years. We're, we're getting towards two years, but, um, you know, we know that this platform is very stable for at least 12 months and this vaccine will go quickly. So I think that's on stability. Um, on uh, tolerability, it looks fine. It's slightly better with the half dose. And uh, as Tom has just said, you end up uh, with more. Uh, scale we've talked about. I don't think anybody else is planning 3 billion doses over 12 months. Uh, I think there will be a market for that. Um, and price, um, of course. My understanding is that both Moderna and Pfizer are in the 20 to 30 dollar range for a single dose, and we're in the three to five dollar range for a single dose, uh, at least until this becomes a seasonal vaccine post post pandemic. Adrian, we'd love to hear your thoughts on the efficacy of the vaccine in different age groups or subpopulations within the trial. There is lots of subgroup analysis to, to come, as I said. Unfortunately, I don't have those. It was a uh, record speed to get the thing analyzed between Saturday and Sunday and have it then there was a bit of presentation going uh, or so Sunday and Monday, rather there was a presentation going on on Monday. So we have it and then we had to submit the paper yesterday. So it's with a, uh, a well-known journal since six o'clock uh, yesterday. And we've been uh, doing some analyses today, but we haven't got the age group stratification. Most of the cases are 18 to 60. There are not that many older individuals yet in our cohort. Because Sorry, there are plenty in there, but not that many cases. Because for obvious safety reasons, you vaccinate in very large numbers the 18 to 55 year olds first, then you go up to the 70 year olds, then you go up to the over 70 year olds. But what we do know, and this was published about a week ago, is that the neutralizing antibodies and total antibodies and T cell responses um, induced by this vaccine are essentially the same in 25 year olds and 75 year olds. So that's very encouraging. And I think other vaccines have a couple have seen that as, as well. So that's, uh, that's lucky. And important. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Daniel, you had a question. Yeah, thanks, Tom and Adrian. Thank you. Um, the virus has shown some signs of mutation. Um, do you have a decent sense of how durable the protection that uh, the virus provide that the vaccine provides will be? Yeah, so there are two things to durability, particularly if you're mentioning strain variation. Um, now let's just cover strain variation first. Um, yeah, people have been sequencing this virus since January. Uh, it's a swarm, like many viruses. You see mutations, but not the backbone changing very much. Um, there is variation, notably the mink for amino acid change. That's the biggest change that's been seen. There have been occasional point mutations that have come and established themselves, uh, which is very interesting virologically, 
But from the point of view of a vaccinologist, where you've got a 1,000 amino acid antigen, you've got all of that being expressed. And when you look for antibodies against different uh, epitopes, you've got antibodies right across the whole spike protein. And remember, we're not using the receptor binding domain, which is less than half, we're using the whole antigen. So I think it's going to take a lot more than the occasional mutation to, uh, to avoid uh, the antibodies that are induced. And some people have done those experiments and taken immune sera and tested them on all the strains they had and the CRFC, all the strains and neutralize all of them. So eventually that may become a problem, but you know, it's not our problem uh, this year or probably next year. In terms of durability, I get tired of saying to people who say, well, people lose their immunity very fast to, uh, to COVID, that firstly, that's not that clear. Titers go down, but there was a really nice study from Oxford actually, uh, put out a few days ago where anybody who had clinical disease and there were thousands in the control group anybody who was infected didn't get get uh, diseased over the next six months and that's a real follow-up study of incidence of of disease so sure natural immunity will wane faster than we would like but it's not that bad and the recurrent cases are you know individual ones that get a paper written about them so it's it's uncommon but but the key point is that any vaccinologist will tell you different vaccines produce immune responses in very different ways, whether they're RNA or they're a viral vector or they're protein in adjuvant, depends on the adjuvant, et cetera, et cetera. It, there's absolutely no reason why if the virus isn't very immunogenic itself, that you can't make uh, an antigen from that virus go into another viral vector that produces durable immunity. So the two don't correlate very well. So, for example, in malaria, we can make antibody titers that are about a thousand times higher after vaccination than the highest level you get by living in a malarious area for 50 years. So they're, they're just different ways of stimulating the immune system. And the fact that the pathogen itself isn't very immunogenic doesn't mean you can't make a, make a vaccine. Thank you so much. Um, Guy, have you had a question? I was just uh, curious a little bit about uh, your views around, um, you know, you, you also see maybe how much do people kind of get the disease, you know, sort of the, the, the R rates, uh, you know, maybe the time it takes to respond to the vaccine. How do you envision beyond manufacturing the distribution of this and, you know, what level do we need to get to, to, uh, to sort of achieve, you know, some form of a, I don't know if herd immunity is the right term for it. Right. But, uh, you know, more comfort in our daily lives, right. That, uh, that we're overcoming it. Yeah, it is herd immunity. That's become sort of a, a bad word in some, uh, <laughs> Some yeah, circles. So, like uh, uh, you know, I think one has to distinguish between the concept and, and, and the, um, the the intent to, to induce it by, by natural exposure. Um, I, I think the modelers are pretty well agreed on that. Uh, you know, it's around about 60 to 70 percent of the population need to be covered with a pretty good vaccine. Um, and if you ask people whether they'll have a vaccine, around about 35% will say, mm, not sure. Um, I think that we'll find out in the next few months, a larger percentage of most populations will actually have the vaccine. I suspect there will be incentives like being allowed to get on an airplane and other things or get a job or go somewhere that will encourage people to have, uh, have it more often. But um, yeah, that's not implausible. You know, 20% of Londoners uh, have already been infected. As I've just said, natural immunity is, is, is better than it's uh, often, often said to be. Um, my head of department said today that he's very keen just to have a single dose of any vaccine, get a tiny bit of immunity and then get COVID because that will do him. And it's not a, it's not a flip and stuff, or maybe it was, but it's, it's not scientifically implausible. You don't want to get severe disease. That's what vaccines have to do. Having mild disease protects you for quite a while. If you have mild disease and you boost people with a vaccine, as we have done, that's very, very good too. So, um, you know, in terms of public health terms, we're trying to stop people dying, or are trying to stop people transmitting to people who, who might die. Uh, I think we can get 65% of the population. Uh, there are some people who think you only should vaccinate the oldest, most vulnerable, those with um, you know jobs that expose them to risk and, and so on. We're beyond that. You know, we can manufacture certainly our vaccine very inexpensively. 
and get it out there. Nothing too complicated about doing that. Uh, why wouldn't you want to have a vaccine is really the, the question. Even if you're 23, you don't want to be accused of infecting anybody. Makes sense. Uh, Krishna, you had a question. Given all the progress that the world's made with Vaxitech and, and the other uh, vaccine companies uh, in COVID, uh, do you see this unlocking uh, more innovation around vaccines after we get through COVID? My hobby horse for years has been quantitative immunogenicity. And this is as good for you or probably more important for you than it is for me. What the world lacks is a requirement to make people index their immune responses on a scale that other people can use. Companies don't like doing this in general. They just want their product to work. And if they have an assay that works for them, that's all the regulators ask for. The great example is back in 2014, 15 with Ebola, when we frankly deployed the wrong Ebola vaccine. The VSV from Merck is almost certainly a lot less immunogenic than the Janssen vaccine, which is now licensed as well. But um, nobody had the data, despite it all being public money funding the Ebola programs, to compare the immune responses in one trial with one vaccine to uh, another trial with the, the other vaccine. Should be simple, but it's not that straightforward. Now we have the ultimate experiment happening before our eyes. Take all the vaccine technologies in the world, fire the starting gun in mid-January 2020 and let people go for it and see what they get in terms of speed to the clinic, safety, immunogenicity, and in many cases, efficacy as well. So we will learn a massive amount about vaccine technologies, old and new, that will de-risk investment. It will stop people telling you guys, oh yeah, we get really good antibodies and T-cells. Are they good for antibodies or good for T-cells, this technology? And you always get the answer, both. By the way, chimpadnos are particularly good for T cells, not for antibodies. That's what we're using them for. They just happen to be useful for antibodies as, as well. So, you know, the whole thing has to get far more quantitative. Otherwise, people are wasting money and they don't know whether their latest creation or new technology really is any good because there isn't a reference immunogen out there to use. So, that will be a huge step forward. You made sense. Thank you. And actually, Daniel and Kenneth's questions are quite similar. Um, Kenneth, maybe you could ask yours. Uh, Adrian, I wonder if you could comment about um, future um, coronavirus pandemics and whether the backbone that you're using because of the immunization you're creating in such a large population would need to be changed. Um, almost certainly not. Let me explain. And this surprises a lot of people. When we started our emerging pathogens program back in 2015 after Ebola, we took that list of 10 outbreak pathogens from the WHO and made nearly all of them in Shadox 1 and some others in Shadox 2. So why weren't we worried that if you'd had a, a Nipah vaccine, you wouldn't be able to be vaccinated with anything else? Well, the answer is that neutralizing antibodies to the vector fade very quickly. The nice illustration of that in COVID is we can boost very well treble the immune responses at a month. If you go out to three months, it looks as if it's even better. Uh, there are data on ad 26 going up 30 fold if you give a boost at three months. So unless the world has Nipah this month and uh, you know Zika the following month and uh, <laughs> whatever, then you're, you're, you're fine. Um, because remember, this is not like a measles virus infection or a polio infection or anything you know about where the virus replicates inside the body and grows. This is a crippled virus. It will not grow inside your arm. So the, 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 the antibodies are there. They're a nuisance for some weeks. Uh, they're still there at some months, but you, know, they're, you can overcome them. And we do give you know, 10 billion virus particles in the vaccine. A lot of them get in. Thank you. Krishna and Daniel's questions were very similar. So Krishna, final question. How long do you think it will be until the UK and the rest of the world are through this pandemic? And do you think COVID will become endemic after that? On the second question, yes. I think there's just too much travel coming into this country to you know, just go and vaccinate everyone and it doesn't come back in, in winter. We can already see that it's, it has seasonal tendencies. When will the pandemic be over? It depends on how you define it. If you say, when are the WHO going to say everything's fine? Well, not for years. It, when it, is life going to return to normal? I'd be disappointed if it weren't pretty normal by May. 
time. Depends how quickly we can, can vaccinate people. It won't be exactly the same ever again, but that might be a might be a good thing. It's a brilliant, cautious note of optimism to finish on. Adrian, um, thank you so much for taking the time. We know how busy you are. We're incredibly grateful for it. Thank you so much from all of us. And thank you for being interested in chimbatnos before anybody knew what they were. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Take care. Thank you all for joining. Really appreciate it.